Ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's three o'clock, Wednesday, 29th of September. It's time to start this webinar. First of all, a warm welcome to you all. My name is Kristina von Sydow. I'm the managing partner of Drud Pedersen Public Affairs Sweden. At Drud Pedersen Public Affairs, we work with political analysis and political strategy. Uh, so to analyze uh, the, the outcome of the German elections with this distinguished panel is a great pleasure. And I would like you to welcome you all uh, and to discuss its implications for Swedish business. We have approximately one hour to discuss many interesting perspectives, and our speakers are Anders Borg, former Minister of Finance for Sweden, Elmar Brock, member of the European Parliament between 1980 and 2019, representing the CDU, among other things, Per Tereson, Swedish ambassador to Germany, Rüdiger Lenz, special advisor to Christian Lindner from the German Liberal Party, and among other things, Bureau Chief from Deutsche Welle to Washington and Brussels. And we have Hendrik Hagemann, who is managing partner for Ruth Pedersen in Berlin and formerly uh, in among many other things, uh, and a special advisor to the former German Minister for Defense, Peter Struck. Now, Germany is EU's largest economy and Sweden's largest trading partner. And that means that the formation of the next German government will have effects on Swedish business, and especially the political agenda of the next government. So this is of great interest for Swedish business. There are many opportunities and perhaps also potential hurdles. Each speaker will give its perspective uh, of coming weeks and the potential outcomes from your respective point of views. Uh, I will start by giving each of them uh, the floor for a couple of minutes to reason around that. And finally, I will open up the floor for discussion uh, towards the end. We also have a chat function where you can post questions if you want to raise a particular issue. As mentioned, I will start by giving the floor to Anders Borg. Anders, we have a result uh, with no clear winner. <laughs> and from your point of view, what are your observations of the situation and uh, what development can be expected from a macro perspective and what sectors might benefit from the election results and the coming negotiations? Well, f first and foremost, uh, it's very important to underline uh, the crucial role Germany plays for, for Swedish industry. It's, it's on the obvious note that it's our biggest export partner, but it's also deeper than so because the industrial cluster in many of the industries where Sweden is strong are very, very close to, to Germany. And basically, I think a lot of our competitiveness is depending on the fact that German, Germany is competitive because we are a common production zone or pr common production cluster. Uh, to my mind, for Swedish industry, the election result is not very worrying. Germany has been stable and will remain stable. Uh, there are many outcomes uh, that are possible, but if you look at Germany as an area for production, uh, for export uh, and for investments, it's very attractive and it will remain attractive. So I, I do think that whether you're a Swedish manufacturing company, an investment from a pension company, Germany will remain a stable partner and also a very stable partner for the rest of Europe. So uh, Europe does well when Germany does well and the Nordic area is particularly um, depending on Germany. Secondly, I would like to point out that after Brexit, Germany's political uh, value and political importance for Sweden has increased dramatically, particularly, I think, for Swedish industry, because there is an openness in Berlin to listen to Swedish companies and Swedish and Nordic interests. There is also in many of the uh, difficult positions and discussions in Brussels, a common value ground between Germany and, and the Nordics. But I do think that it's important that Swedish companies spend more time in Germany and particularly more time in Berlin. When it comes to the election result, uh, I must say that all the different constellations that are possible, 
just underline what, you, what I've just said. Uh, Germany will be a stable partner in Europe, uh, whether it's SDP or CDU that is leading the government. Uh, Germany will be an important partner to Sweden, regardless of whether it's CDU or SDP that, that runs the government. Uh, there will be complicated negotiations, uh, particularly if it's a broad coalition with both the Greens and, and uh, FDP involved. Uh, the, uh, however, I wouldn't get too worried because if we're talking about China or relations to Russia or the future of Europe, at the end of the day, the, the government will be nominated with, with, with the, the forces that, that will uh, uphold the stability. On the positive side, there is some opportunities. Merkel has been a fantastic chancellor. I think we all in Europe uh, are, are sending our greetings and thankfulness and those of us who have worked with her, different governments. It's very important to underline how important she has been. But there is a possibility now for some renewal and new en energy in, in the German economy. And I would like to point to three areas where I'm a little bit more optimistic. One is the very large energy transition. It's complicated. There are difficult uh, conflicts of interest regarding coal and natural gas. But the opportunities in new investments for renewable energy, where some of the Nordic companies are very strong, I think will, it's going to be massive. We are likely to see a, a really strong capex boom in Germany over the next decade. Uh, because there, there has to be new investments in, in the energy sector. The second area is digitalization. Uh, coming from Sweden and with the Stockholm perspective, Berlin sometimes seems to be lacking a little bit of the digital in infrastructure. The connectivity is not always what you expect. The digitalization of society in terms of um, shopping online, doing banking, uh, having contacts with the governments are not as uh, uh, far as they are in, in the Nordic area. Here, I think a new government, regardless of who is running it, can actually also uh, launch some broad investments to modernize Germany in a way that, that I think would be very interesting. A third point from my side is that there is obviously an interest in Germany for a pension reform. It, it is a long-standing uh, issue that, that has to be dealt with. And as I understand from the conversation I've had in Berlin uh, with people at the Ministry of Finance and in other circles, there is an opening now to maybe do something more of a Nordic style pension system where people have strong incentives to stay on in the labor force, where maybe some of the assets could actually be funded where maybe this could also revitalize the German capital market with uh, some more, more uh, investments in, in equity. So I do think that there is a pretty high probability that Germany, even if market has done an exceptionally good job, actually could see a little bit of an investment boom coming, really regardless of who is sitting in the government. So I'm not worried. I'm quite optimistic about Germany, and I'm also fundamentally convinced that Germany will be remaining as a very stable European partner for all of the Nordic countries. So that is my, my kind of first take. And uh, Christina, now let's continue. Thank you very much, Anders, for this uh, interesting outlook to Germany. So we can expect an investment boom, perhaps. So, to dive deeper into this topic, I turn to Hendrik Hagemann. Uh, given this bit inconclusive result, um, what are the different coalition options and their different probabilities? What decisions, agreements, negotiation around business related issues will be high on the agenda in these talks and what should Swedish business follow closely? Yeah, thank you so much, um, Christina, and, and thank you, thank you all of you for for, for being for giving us the opportunity to talk about this. I will not continue with the figures, but I will start with. Um, so Germany has, after Sunday, uh, an extremely interesting result of around six to seven parties when you count them all in Parliament. So the situation is resembling actually that of our most of our neighboring countries. 
and not anymore the old days with the two strong, we call them people's party, where they use one small partner for a coalition. The second thing I, I just want to turn, point to just one time is Germany does not have a a real uh, procedure on how to form a government. Different to all of our neighboring countries, the head of state is not uh, assigning the person with the strongest fraction to form a government. That would be due to the very strong showing of the SPD, Mr. Scholz, and to, to the terrible result Elmer will re refer on, first of all, not Mr. Laschet. So we have an interesting situation that right now the two small parties or smaller parties, the Greens, with a fantastic result doubling their size, then the Liberals also with a strong result, both also with decisive and very, very charismatic leaders, are now negotiating, and they did that last night, he and Jeremy all over the media, um, posted on Instagram, so a little bit of digitalization is finally also arriving in Germany, but under words, they're much too polite. They are now pre-negotiating, and as in Game Theory 101, will then probably, as our sources say, on Friday start negotiations with the SPD. So, Rupert is in Berlin. We currently assume that the most likely uh, coalition and the first who will do negotiations, Series 1, will be the so-called traffic light coalition run by the SPD, a Councillor Scholz with the Liberals and the Greens in power. If they fail, the next most likely coalition, with around 20%, is a, what we hear generally call the Jamaica coalition. Then the CDU, and it doesn't mean if it's Mr. Laschet, and I will also refer to this later, will have the second chance of forming a government together with the two small parties. Last but not least, we always have the fallback option of a, and as we see at Rupinus in the likelihood at 10%, that a ground coalition, but this time reverse under the leadership of Mr. Scholz will come into place. But we have a small certainty that the, that the winners of the election, the three parties, SPD, Greens, and Liberals, will form a government. What will be decided, and what will be, it's, it's really called a so-called future coalition, they will certainly talk about a massive infrastructure investment spree as we expect in the budget in April and in the budget in November to come. The, um, Germany has a lot of firepower to invest uh, uh, to, to borrow money. Mr. Schultz is keen on doing that. The CDU stalwarts are not anymore in government. So the investment in digitalization and in infrastructure uh, will, will be key. Another thing which I will want to point out is that the new government will probably introduce a very modern Canadian-style immigration law. Germany needs 300 to 400,000 immigrants. This needs to be controlled. All three parties are very open to that. Another point I want to point out, because this should be of interest for Sweden, is that finally Germany will take part probably in a European banking union. There's a large understanding in all three partners, and the CDU diehards are not any one government, that a common currency, the euro, needs also a common banking system. It doesn't make any sense that when you, borrow, when you have money in Texas and you can invest it in California, why that's not the same place in the euro area. I think this will be a massive, massive implication also for, for, for you in Sweden. Look out at Germany's relation to Russia with the Greens, a strong fraction, predominantly young, predominantly female, but not comparable to, to the Swedish Greens, much more in the middle, but they will have a very, very harsh take on Russia, as liberals and SPD do too, and they will be much more critical in regard to Germany's relating to China. Very, very last but not least, because I know that this is of interest, big tech has been on the on the focus of the Greens particular, especially companies like Facebook, but also Google and Amazon. Um, they, but this will probably be solved in a European solution. And the ever, ever base is housing, as in Sweden, it's a difficult situation. There you can also expect uh, uh, move, uh, de de uh, decisions by the government because this is one of the most pressing. I was prepared to look forward to your question. So, uh, thank you very much, Hendrik. And since you mentioned uh, relationship to Russia, I have a question from the chat uh, around the German position on uh, Nord Stream 2. Will 
the next government change its position? No. No seems to have finished. Uh, Mr. Scholz is a key proponent who was, uh, who we need the gas from Russia. I was yesterday evening at a party uh, of the SPD. I'm a member of them. I was actually had, had the chance of one minute talking to Mr. Scholz. I didn't ask him about Nord Stream because there's no need to discuss it with him. Nord Stream is there and it, and it stays there and Germany needs it, but maybe then I will be better in your parts to, to, to also refer to that one. Thank you very much. Uh, Christina, if, if, if I would already be allowed to chime in so we can put it off the table, uh, yes. there's a very dif difficult answer to it because it's not off the table because the Americans are still pressuring us, which means we don't know yet how much compensation we will have to pay to Ukraine and what it will mean politically versus Ukraine and Poland. Uh, and so far, it's, it's a question which uh, the next government has to tackle as well as in the foreign policy area, as well as in economics. Uh, but the, uh, Hendrik is totally right. It is sitting there, uh, ready to go. But before the flow starts, uh, we have to settle some questions with our American friends and our Eastern European neighbors. Thank you. So we can uh, expect energy investments to be uh, high on the agenda, but yes. with some uh, political hurdles to watch out for. Thank you very much, uh, Hendrik, and also for this comment, uh, Miguel. Um, I will now give the floor to Elmar Brook, and here, if you could please elaborate on how the CDU will play this, given that they did uh, a very bad election for being the CDU, and despite having had the chancery for 16 successful years under the leadership of uh, Mrs. Merkel, uh, what will the CDU focus on in possible negotiations with the Greens and the Liberals? Thank you very much. I uh, would like to make also my short remark to Nord Stream 2 in the beginning yes. to complete the picture. Then it needs also still some decisions in Brussels because on a certain part of the pipeline, when it comes to the German shores, uh, you need European law and there is the question of unbundling for that short part. And uh, here, uh, in uh, opinion, political opinions and legal opinions, this is not yet fulfilled by the proposals we are on the table. So that might become uh, to, to, to a law, even to a law case if the Commission does not go in the right direction with environmental organizations, but also some Eastern European countries. Uh, to the question itself, uh, what was mentioned here, I agree with Anders, we will have any way a stable <laughs> Germany. Uh, we have a situation that in any government, two parties will be always there. These are the Greens and the Liberals. Uh, and uh, therefore, it's the third part, the biggest one is the Social Democrats or the Christian Democrats. We have a situation that all four parties are convinced Europeans. Mm -hmm. We have the luxury problem in Germany that we have no anti-European party. Mm -hmm. And we have to see that the, uh, it seems so that the Social Democrats are able to delete from the political spectrum the left former Communist Party, uh, which is, I think, a uh, very important uh, point for the uh, future developing in Germany, and that the right-wing party is totally isolating and has also lost votes. So it is also on both edges a sign of stability. Uh, the result itself is for my party a mess, but it's uh, at the end for both parties a mess. Both the Social Democratic and the Christian Democratic Party, uh, as we have called them, people's parties, which had all parts of society within them, were fighting each other on the level of between 40 and 50 percent. Now we're fighting on the level of 25 percent. That has with uh, changes in society everywhere in the world to do, but also in Europe and in Germany. Uh, but we have another political tradition here. And uh, this makes it quite difficult for the future. The Social Democrats were already earlier in that stage. They were down to 15, 60 percent and came up to 25. 
five, we went down from 34 percent to 25. So uh, they were a little bit faster in this development, but the results is more or less for both the same. But because they came up, uh, it has uh, uh, a, an optimistic way and we have a pessimistic way. But the result is not, not so much different between the two parties. Then is one point to care to the Swedish <coughs> uh, society. The CDU cannot uh, uh, cannot uh, compare our history with Moratana in Sweden. It's a totally different thing. Moratana came always from the business side, the conservative side. The CDU as People's Party was always a business conservative part, a liberal part, and a Christian social part, very much coming from the Catholic and uh, uh, Protestant social teaching, as we call it, and with a very big trade union wing. In the 2013 elections, Mrs. Merkel had the majority of trade union uh, members voting for Christian Democrats in Germany. So that is a totally different point. And here we have to see, and that will be the fight uh, in the CDU in the upcoming months and years, whether we come back to such a broad level or we become a type of moderatana. If we become a type of moderatana, this will stick there where moderatana is. Uh, but not coming back to 35 and 40 percent. This is the strategic decision uh, we have to take and whether the party is able to do so. And uh, this will be, I think, a problem which we have to deal with. Uh, we have to see that uh, uh, at the moment uh, we have not a uh, king with authority, but many lousy, bar lousy barons. Uh, which everyone believes he could be the king. That is the classical way in such a situation. And this, this shows uh, at the moment for the liberals and the greens that we uh, internally as a party not stable enough to form a government for four years. I was optimistic uh, until Monday evening or Tuesday lunchtime yesterday that we could keep it together and that because the Liberals prefer a coalition with us and the Greens were partly open to that. But I think in the course of the second part of today, this was destroyed as a possibility, especially because the big lousy Baron from Bavaria destroyed it finally publicly. And uh, this, I think, is the situation we have. Now we wait for our second chance if the so-called traffic light coalition is not able to come together and then we will be asked by that. After some discussions and talks I had in the last days and this morning, I believe that Ampel will be able to come to a common program and uh, that this chance will not come to the Christian Democrats. I believe that in the question of taxation, they find a solution in the income taxation that, uh, let's say, a couple together with 300,000 uh, euros income does not get under special attention by the tax office <laughs> above. Uh, that you can explain even to liberal voters. Uh, it will not come the Vermögensteuer. What is that in English? Well, tax, isn't it? Wealth tax. Uh, hmm? Wealth tax. Wealth tax. The, wealth the wealth tax will not come uh, as a compromise. The Greens and the Socialists will not stick to that because here the Liberals cannot jump. And the, soli so, uh, the question of the soli, uh, which is that 10% uh, of your population still pay for German unification, will be put off, off, uh, off the table because anyway the German Constitutional Court will delete that. And this will mean that the big taxation question, which is the most important point uh, for the Liberals uh, towards their own uh, electorate, will not destroy a possibility of such an agreement. That was my feeling, what I heard from the Greens and the Social Democrats this morning. And uh, therefore, I think, Mr. Mr. 
uh, would uh, put my money, not all of my money, but most of my money on Mr. Scholz as the next chancellor. What it means uh, uh, in, in content terms, uh, that was also key in this discussion. Is it on one side to make it possible that we have more private investment or public investment? The Social Democrats talked about always about the 50 billion reserves which the Merkel government has put <coughs> on the board. And that is the main instrument now to deal with. And the CDU would have gone more for possibilities to interest private investments. There's enough money in Germany available, but because of our taxation system and other reasons, we are not able to put that on the market for private investment. And here, I think, might come a, a, a difference in because of tradition and method uh, in thinking and all the reasons. And here might be a, a problem. And here we come now at the end again to Europe. Uh, we will see that might be a danger for Sweden. Uh, the social democratic led government might go further to the southern Europeans and the French and the frugal four would lose a, a partly ally not just in the financial sector, but also internal market legislation, internal market legislation, uh, where the question of more uh, bureaucratic lines on a European internal market election also in fit for 55, because the German government would then more on that side than on the other side. And here, I think, on that European level, both financially as well as economically, and in regulation terms, it might be a problem. And you have to see, as we had in the European Union, this 750 billion next generation package, which was is a good, very good one. But it's seen from the German government until now that it was for, done for once to overcome the crisis. Mr. Scholz called it as a Hamilton moment. And the Hamilton moments would mean to continue on that level normally in the future. And this is, I think, in style a total different thing, and that might be also the discussion for our frugal friends. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for very interesting and valuable insights into uh, both the, the CDU, but also the, the future uh, perspective and outlook for Europe. We will go back to Europe a little later as well. And I can also say that you managed to answer two questions in the chat around the wealth tax, but also how Germany will maintain its position in the EU. <coughs> but we can dive deeper into that. I will leave the floor to Rudiger Lenz. Uh, from your perspective, uh, with the little angle, um, what are the options for, for the Liberal Party and how will they play the negotiations with the Greens, as I have understood that the Greens and the Liberal are the mo two parties that are most opposed to each other in these uh, four-party talks. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, I think um, Elmar knows the Liberals so well, he already took away some of my major points, but that is not oh, a difficulty sorry. because I have still more to come. But I think he rightly so pointed that one option is more or less at the moment off the table, and that's Jamaica. And that makes it extremely difficult for the Liberals. Because with two options on the table, they would have had much more room of maneuver to trade and to, uh, uh, to haggle with the SPD and the Greens. And so far, they are now more under pressure than ever before. And then comes the traumatic experience from 2017. Stepping out of coalition talks was not what was well deserved, neither by the public nor by their own constituency. So where are their fundamentals and can they keep them? I think the two fundamentals which we already have touched here and then are, yes, on one hand, and I think rightly so, um, Emma already pointed out, there's the deficit spending uh, of Scholz uh, loosening the debt break and, and sort of spreading government money into all future investments as far from 
ecology to education and what have you. And then there is the, uh, the FDP, which says, okay, uh, unleash all the forces which have been leashed, so to speak, over the last couple of years and even more. Uh, reduction of, of uh, restrictions, uh, bringing down barriers, uh, finding private investment, uh, giving incentives, and also tax uh, breaks uh, or tax, uh, uh, tax releases. Uh, that's the fundamental difference still, and I think it will be the major difference which have to be overcome during the coalition talks. I think that was the major reason why the liberals, until very last, and I talked to Lindner last, yes, last night, uh, why they were very much in favor of Jamaica, because that would have given me more, much more leeway to maneuver and to, to debate and to discuss. So uh, having said that, uh, there is another problem, and that's sort of an ideological problem. Uh, with a green-red coalition, where the liberals are more or less forced into it, uh, they would be seen as staying always on the break not being the future-oriented party of reforms, but sort of trying to, uh, trying to, uh, to uh, contain uh, the demands of the left within the SPD and the left within the Greens. And both are very strong forces. So, I mean, this is not a very, let's say, luxurious seat which they would be having to, to uh, which they would be forced in. Whereas a coalition with, uh, with uh, uh, Laschet uh, would have been more on the reform part. They would have been the drivers. They would have been the pushers. They would have been given incentives in many areas where the CDU was lagging behind. So it's an ideological question as well, because you don't want to be seen as a, always staying on the brakes and being the one warning and being the one... Uh, debating and discussing what has not to be done instead of what should be done. Now to the personalities. I think Lindner is very clear, and that would be a high price for the other two to be, to be paid, to become finance minister with sort of a veto right. <laughs> and, and, and that, I couldn't see at the moment, is not going down very easily with both other partners. In so far, I think they have a lot of talks uh, before them. What is very good is that they are now talking uh, behind closed doors with the pragmatic part of the Greens, which means here they could form sort of a common agenda and common uh, uh, platform, which then would have to be at least partly swallowed by the SPD. But if you see uh, who will be on the SPD side and will be the ones uh, negotiating, I think here you have the full party, which means all the left part of the SPD is reflected within the coalition talks uh, 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 format. Um, coming back to what I said at the very beginning, um, it would have been much better for, for the coalition talks if, the second, uh, if both options would have stayed on the table. Uh, having said that, I think uh, the CDU is blame uh, it's for itself uh, that this doesn't happen anymore. And in so far, uh, we all know that uh, one of the losers, the big losers here, is the Prime Minister of Bavaria, who has a big part in the result of his party, as well as the ongoing uh, destructional talks which are out in the open. Uh, one last point. I think the Liberal will not step out of the, uh, of the uh, coalition talks uh, because of their trauma. Uh, they have something to gain. They have a good, good uh, uh, sort of team, but especially in finance, in budget, it will be decisive that they hold course. Uh, Emma already said uh, no hike in corporate tax, uh, a slight change in, in income tax. Uh, the solely, I think, is debatable. If it stays for one year longer or one year less, this is not a big no, no. issue. And, and, the and Constitutional more, Court will anyway delete it. I know, right, so. And the last one is, I already heard from the Liberals, they are flexible as far as, far as the debt break is concerned, uh, as far as 2023 is concerned. Not for 22. It might, might, uh, might be loosened for 22 and continue. Uh, uh, but uh, then I think they have to insist. If, if they can hold this uh, position, I don't know. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rüdiger. These are also very valuable insights uh, in getting the whole picture. 
Uh, I will give the floor to Per Tureson, uh, as Swedish ambassador to Germany. I mean, there, there are situation, <coughs> the situation now around the discussion of the formation of a government reminds at least me a little bit of the situation in Sweden, which we've had for the past mandate period. Uh, so from your point of view, uh, posted in Germany, what should Swedish business expect from the outcome? What should they pay attention for? As mentioned at the beginning, Germany is an even more important partner to Sweden after Brexit, uh, already being the largest trading partner. How should Swedish business navigate around this? How should they position themselves? Well, thank you, uh, Christina. And, and uh, first of all, I, I must say so much, so many wise words have already been spoken. I agree with most of the analysis. I think it's clear that we're not standing in front of a revolution in Germany. Uh, no matter which uh, coalition comes into force, the changes will be within sort of the normal. Um, and I also agree that uh, the traffic light uh, coalition is the most likely, uh, especially after the, the last few days on Sunday, it seemed all open, but, but now I agree that uh, the traffic light is the more, most likely. And we do have to remember that uh, we can analyze the party's positions and, and draw uh, preliminary uh, conclusions. But in the end, it will all come down in a rather big document called uh, a coalition treaty. The last one was 178 uh, pages. Uh, this one, I think, could be even, even longer. Uh, but I think from, from our point of view and also from the EU, it would be very desirable to have a new government on this side of Christmas. Uh, not that I don't want to hear Angela Merkel's 17th New Year's speech, but it would be refreshing to, to have a, a new government. But she is already writing for, on it. <laughs> <yes>. <laughs> and I, I think for the business, uh, uh, some general uh, remarks. We are already uh, extremely well placed. I mean, our two economies are quite integrated, uh, intertwined, and they're also very complementary, which I think is a, a good thing. Uh, you, can, you can look at Germany as sort of the economical trade uh, research development machine in Europe. Uh, Sweden, we are a real-sized uh, testbed. Uh, we are the startup cra cradle of Europe. Uh, we are digital early adopters. So if you combine these strengths, I think uh, that would be an offer for the rest of the world, which very few could uh, compete with. Um, to, be, to, to try and break it down into areas, and I think all of them have already been, been mentioned. Of course, there is a huge uh, need in Germany for a climate and sustainable investments. Uh, we have the next generation e, uh, European Union, but we also have uh, bilateral needs. Uh, and uh, the question is, will that be with or without debts? That has already been, been touched upon. Uh, it will happen, whether with uh, new debts uh, or with tax breaks, incentives and, and uh, uh, other measures will, will have to be seen. Sweden is very well placed uh, in this area with our system thinking, uh, with uh, uh, innovations uh, and with most of the relevant Swedish companies all, already present in Germany. Another such area is digitization. I'm surprised that we are still all connected. Uh, that's not always the case when I sit uh, here and, and take part in video. Your Excellency, I, I dropped out three times already. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm the proof point. I'm the proof yeah. point. Uh, <laughs> And also there, I think uh, Sweden is, is extremely well placed uh, and, and, and the Swedish companies uh, already in Germany. Uh, a third area, of course, energy. That's the, I think, biggest challenge for, for Germany in the coming 10, 20 years, uh, where they're replacing both uh, coal and nuclear. Uh, the renewables uh, are not enough. And I think that it's in this light we have to see the Nord Stream 2 uh, uh, solution, which will be uh, for a p transition period until the other sources are, are there. Uh, but I would specifically also mention um, hydrogen. 
already the, the sitting government uh, decided to invest, I think it was 9 billion euros in production, in research and in infrastructure for hydrogen. And we have a huge area up in northern Sweden with cheap and absolutely clean energy, loads of water. So I think there that, that could be a very interesting area for Swedish uh, uh, companies. Um, and I, I think also, uh, I mean, we will have a government in Germany which is uh, relying on a rules-based uh, free trade uh, still in the world will uh, push very hard for the EU to, to push its uh, competitiveness. We have an innovation partnership already with Germany with many of these uh, areas uh, uh, in it and we could probably uh, extend that, including, for instance, for, for hydrogen. There are a few uh, dangers, I think, and some of them have been touched upon. I, I would mention the minimum wage issue. Uh, it's one thing that both the Greens and the, the Social Democrats wants to raise the uh, German minimum wage to 12 euros, uh, up from below 10 today. Uh, but they are not as uh, solid friends uh, of Sweden in the European Union as the uh, CDU and CSU uh, would be. Uh, and it's also been mentioned, uh, fiscal union, stability pact, where are they going, how, how far would they be, be ready to go. So there are a few things that we need to watch how they develop, but uh, I think all in all, I'm looking forward to uh, seeing the results of the uh, negotiations and a new coalition treaty. And I think cooperation between our economies will continue to, to be extremely good. Thank you very much, Per. Uh, this is also very interesting insights and observations. And uh, we have sort of zoomed in on Germany and now we will zoom out a little bit to look at the, the EU. We've already mentioned it. What will the new German government, uh, what kind of position will it take towards the EU? Are there any positions to be changed? I have two questions in the chat. Uh, around the EU and the first one, uh, if there are any possible consequences regarding the German position vis-à-vis -vis the ECB, the European Central Bank, uh, and then another position around Olaf Scholz as possible new Chancellor, if he will be able to take up eventually, not immediately of course, but the position of uh, Angela Merkel in the European Council. So if I turn to Anders first around the ECB, uh, and then we'll see if there is anyone else who wants to comment on the ECB question. Fundamentally, I, I think price stability is engraved in, in the German uh, political system and uh, I, I think it's a very low probability that a, a shifting government would, would change that in, in any major way. Inflation has increased in Germany. Um, it will continue to increase because oil prices are already up and gas prices were dramatically up uh, just the other day here after the election. So I think we are looking at inflation at least uh, increasing the next two quarters. Um, that will be controversial in Germany, as we all know. And it will mean that, that uh, Jens Weidemann and the Bundesbank will be more critical uh, towards uh, uh, Christine Lagarde and, and the leadership of, of ECB. Uh, there could also be political reactions on inflation in Germany that could reinforce that criticism. But fundamentally, uh, Germany is pro st price stability. Bundesbank is a key partner in, in the European central banking system. And I do think that low inflation pressure coming out of globalization, robotization uh, and, and et cetera is, is still the main uh, outline. I, I think the ECB has a forecast of uh, 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 harmonized consumer price index at, at 1.5 for 2023. It might be slightly above that, but uh, inflation expectations remain well anchored. So this debate between Bundesbank and ECB will continue, but it will not fundamentally change um, due to the election. Hendrik, would you like to comment as well? Yeah, two, two points um, for the audience to, uh, to point out. One is uh, good news in that regard, or maybe an individual to point out, Mr. Scholz was a rather efficient and successful Minister of Finance. That's very rare that we have a Chancellor 
was so deep in, into the material. He has with uh, State Secretary Jörg Kukis, someone, a former German uh, CEO of Goldman Sachs, who has guided him in these kind of politics. He's certainly not a friend of Mr. Weidmann, but this is more to party antiques. Um, yeah, and the other point would be that with the Liberal Party, most likely in the scam of thrones, taking the Ministry of Finance, that's already why we even speak here, becoming more and more sure, and uh, they, they will have a thorough lead on the Ministry of Finance and continue the German traditions in regard to Bundesbank and ECB. Um, uh, so, so I think uh, these are maybe two flavors to add on, on what Anders very rightly said. So, and then um, the, the other question around the position of Germany in the European Council and the next Chancellor. But after the last German election, Europe waited for Angela Merkel in the Council to, to sort of come back. There, there was sort of no agenda that was pushed in the Council, as far as I understand from my sources who were present at those meetings. However, at this point, if there will be completely new Chancellor uh, being Olaf Scholz. Uh, it will take some time for him to to, uh, to to get warmed up. And we have France with a presidential election coming up and Emmanuel Macron, who has a strong idea of what he wants to do with Europe and the French European agenda. What can we expect from there? I would like to hear if uh, Per and Elmar and Rüdiger has comments. Please, uh, thank you. you raise your hand first. Yes, exactly. And I think uh, from a perspective of a Swedish uh, news uh, consumer, I think we are under, underestimating Olaf Scholz. Uh, he's being described as a boring politician and uh, scholz o -Mat and, and what have you. Uh, I think we're dealing here with a politician that has been vice chancellor for the past four years. He's been uh, presiding also the ECOFIN, participating in those. He's been in the G20, he's been in G7. Uh, he knows Emmanuel Macron already quite well. Uh, rumor has it that it was actually those two who negotiated the recovery uh, package. Uh, so I, th I think uh, he will probably be able to fill uh, Angela Merkel's shoes uh, quite well. I mean, of course, it will take some time, but, uh, but I think in his... Uh, and, and it's important because France will uh, be the, the presidency of the European Union next year. And I think uh, that uh, connection between those two will, will help Macron. It might be dangerous for Sweden because I think there is a tendency in Germany to, to want to help Macron win the elections in April, which might uh, force some positions which we are not so happy with. But... Uh, in conclusion, I think we are under, underestimating uh, Mr. Schultz. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Elmar. Yeah, I know. Look, uh, to the question of the recovery plan, that is the election campaign uh, rumor that Schultz negotiated. That were, was Merkel made it politically possible in Germany and without with Macron. Uh, in detail, he might play, have played a role as member of ECOFIN. Uh, but uh, I think, uh, first of all, a German chancellor, uh, when he uh, behaves uh, well, will always be a leading figure in the European Union. Secondly, if uh, is the German uh, chancellor is well advised, he will never do it alone. And thirdly, uh, because Emmanuel Macron has the uh, EU presidency, uh, next year, uh, before his elections, every German chancellor would give him the chance to show that he, is, he could be also European king in order to win the elections. <laughs> that would that would not uh, make a difference who would be chancellor. And therefore, I believe the traditional German-French relationship will become uh, will bring it together again. Hopefully, they will be able to broaden it. And I hope when Nord Stream 2 is uh, forgotten in Poland, uh, that we have also on the eastern side a partner with the Weimar Triangle. And uh, here, I think uh, I will not see a major difference. 
One very, very short remark. Uh, yes. I, I think that uh, if, if we, we would like, have, having been a race between Laschet and, and Scholz, who is the better European and who, who would reach uh, the, the finishing line first, I think uh, Laschet would be a little bit ahead of Scholz. But the difference no. is not big. And, and, and especially in foreign and security policy, where we have to do more. Absolutely. One, one uh, obstacle, though, I think what we could see in foreign policy, and that sort of then uh, simmers in into European policy, is if the Greens are keeping their very strict and, and, and humanistic way and very critical way towards our Eastern European neighbors, that would make it difficult. Uh, because yeah. they, yeah. they are very pragmatic in this question. And if they are fundamental in these questions, then we have one of the possible blowouts which might emerge earlier than, than, than later. Thank you. And uh, this True. seems to be a topic uh, that raises the attention of, of the audience. So I've just got a question in the chat. If there is an outlook for an uh, attempt to a power grab in the Council by Macron or Marc Rutte during the autumn, does anyone see that? Look, yeah, look, uh, first of all, Macron and Rutte are not very close together. And uh, there will be not a close co uh, cooperation. And, um, and I think uh, uh, that Rutte might have a chance uh, later to go to the president of the European Council, where we hear re rumors, or become the successor of Ursula von der Leyen which is the rumor, but it's still a long time to go for that. Yeah. Still a long time to go for that. And uh, this does not play a role immediately. But that is also one point I have to mention here uh, on a European level, uh, European People's Party Christian Democrats. Ursula von der Leyen is a Christian Democrat. And uh, she will be there. And the European People's Party, with the CDU, sees what the strongest group is in the European People's Party, is still the strongest group in the European Parliament. So, via this European level, uh, the CDU is not totally out in European yeah. debates. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, uh, and when you see that 70% of the economic related legislation, is done in Europe, not anymore in the nation state, because of internal market legislation or also environmental negotiation. Uh, to do that. And now at this moment, I get a telephone. <laughs> Can you put Laschet on loud, please? <laughs> no, that was that was Bütikofer. Oh, Reinhard. Okay. So the Greens still talk to the Christian Democrats. Very good. The pragmatic ones. Yeah. Yes. So um, we are uh, reaching uh, the uh, zooming in towards the end of this webinar. It's clearly uh, a topic that could be discussed uh, further and in more detail, and there are several topics to follow up. <laughs> Before we conclude, I would like to turn to you, Hendrik, uh, to ask uh, where you see the biggest opportunities for Swedish business. We have touched upon uh, energy transformation, public investments, digitalization, pension reform. Is there anything in particular to watch out for uh, and how to navigate that you would pass on as a final message to the audience? Um, you pretty much said it, and um, I, I, I mean, as you all are aware, we Germans uh, love and trust into Swedish brands, be it Volvo, be it Ikea, be it Klarna, be it uh, Spotify. Um, this, I think this is a massive chance for Swedish uh, business, Swedish interest. When you look at the biggest success stories in Germany, like uh, Zalando or HelloFresh and other companies, they have been financed by Swedish uh, capital. I think this connection of Sweden, the much more faster speedboat and, and giving us Germans a little neck sometimes on the back will be a fantastic opportunity 
for the next uh, four years to come. One very last point, and this is something probably for our audience more to think of, of themselves where, where there could be an opportunity. The pension reform the, the next government will do is actually dubbed here in Germany in the media. This is, we want, and this is done by the Social Democrats, Greens and Liberals as we want to copy the Swedish model. So Sweden, again, as in many, many decades before, is the role model for, for modernization and, and, and development. So it will be interesting to see, but I think the opportunities are amazing and, and massive for Sweden. Thank you. And that, uh, those are very interesting and reassuring uh, final notes. Uh, we should pass the message on to Swedish business that there are major opportunities with regard to the coming years in, in Germany and to uh, actually look out for opportunities, uh, not be shy. Uh, to sum up uh, the decisions on the economic agenda in Germany and uh, with regard to the EU will affect Sweden and the uh, Swedish business, uh, Swedish companies. We are well positioned uh, in those sectors that have been mentioned, energy transformation, digitalization and also pension reform and uh, asset management investment. I would like to thank you in the panel for taking the time and sharing your insights uh, on these topics. Very, very interesting and uh, to be continued. I would also like to take uh, the opportunity to thank the audience for listening and uh, asking questions in the chat room. So we had had a more precise discussion and talks and I would conclude by wishing you all a continued happy afternoon and thank you very much once more.